everybody, this is Constance with Mysterious Galaxy. I am very, very excited because tonight we have Sam Mags with us and her amazing phones for the Unstoppable Wasp, and she is going to be in conversation with Marine Goo, who you guys are also familiar with because our YA book club read her newest book. So I'm going to go ahead and yes, somewhere only we know. <laughs> is important um so both of their books if you are interested in more information beyond the discussion are going to be on the link that is at like the top of the viewing bar for what you are seeing and you can get signed books from sam mags so click on that link for more details i'm going to go ahead and virtually walk away and marie take it away bye hi Hi, I'm so excited to be doing this, even though we're doing it long distance. It's like nice to hang out. We're in the same city, though. Yeah. So it's yeah. basically like it's basically like hangout for real. Yeah, I think I'm like 20 minutes away from you. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's not bad. Yeah, that's pretty good for L.A. Yeah, I grew up in um, the, the city that you're in. I won't re reveal it in case it's secrets, but it's okay. I'm like deep in the valley and you know what? I like it. I like it. It's hot. It's like 10 billion hours from the beach. Oh. <laughs> it's just for all the, it's where all the action is. It is. There's a lot of work here, which is good. And you know, it's, it's like the great thing about LA, I feel is that having everybody in one spot, everyone is always like, oh my God, we should hang out. But then we always end up only seeing each other like at conventions, like y'all yeah, West <laughs> anyways. So we didn't have those this year. So now we have stuff like this. I know. Just as good, right? Just as good. Yeah, totally. Um, and thank yeah. you for being here to talk about the book today. Uh, do you want to like I loved it. yourself first and talk a little bit about your book as well? Oh, um, sure. So I'm Maureen Gu. I am a YA author. And my latest book, um, as I mentioned, is Somewhere Only We Know. Um, it came out in paperback in May, so you can get it in paperback at Mysterious Galaxy. Um, it's about a K-pop star who, I'm like, wow, I haven't pitched this book in so long. <laughs> <laughs> I caught you off guard, I'm sorry. It was like, sell yourself, Maureen. I'm like, oh, what's <laughs> it um, It's about a K-pop star who escapes from her handlers for a day in Hong Kong on her Asian tour, and she meets a really cute guy named Jack and they spend an unforgettable day together and change each other's lives. Um, and I'm also, and the reason why I um, am talking with Sam specifically is because I am also the author of the upcoming Silk series that's coming out, the reboot, um, the comic, which unfortunately was supposed to come out this month, but because of pandemic, you know, everything's been delayed. So I'm not sure when it will come out. Um, which was a relief for me to hear recently. Um, so more details on that soon. But yes. That so is. excited for that. Uh, Silk is my favorite spider person, uh, which I always talk about. I'm like obsessed with her when I worked well, at the company that was making the Spider-Man video games, like every single day. Would... You mentioned her in your book. I was so excited. She is in the book because yeah. so yeah, my name's Sam Eggs. I wrote but The Unstoppable Wasp. Built on Hope, which came out yesterday. It is a YA novel following the adventures of Nadia Van Dyne, who is the Wasp. Uh, she's a teen scientist. She is a teen superhero. She's trying to be the best friend, the best hero, the best driver, the best lab leader, the best scientist, the best everything she possibly can be. And it's really hard. And one of these things that she's dealing with is having bipolar disorder. So she sees a superhero therapist, which by the way, I think all superheroes should have therapists. And frankly, mm -hmm. I think all people should have access to therapists because we would all be happier and better people if we were all in therapy. <laughs> um, but uh, Nadia's therapist is also Silk's therapist. So she's oh, familiar with this. Yeah. So great. So um, that was one thing I was like, oh my God, she also sees a therapist. I was really surprised by that. I love, I love this new generation of superheroes. So when I was reading this, so this is your first YA novel. So in case people don't know, this isn't um, a graphic novel. It's not a comic. It's an actual prose YA novel, but it's like so beautiful. It, I was so jealous. It has, it's like illustrated end papers. I couldn't get over that. They so look so cool. good. 
And then you've got a lot of like um, spot illustrations and like kind of graphic stuff happening in here where she introduces, oh, it's hard to see, but she introduces oh, yeah. characters and has like, it's really neat. Um, it has, so it kind of has like that visual comic book like shout out, but it's a novel. Um, I really love, I don't know, for lack of a better word, but it's just like way more progressive and feminist and inclusive. Um, and I was just so, I haven't, I, to be honest, I haven't read the comics. I, your book is my introduction to um, oh, cool. Nadia. Yeah. And I love her. So like, um, why don't you talk a little bit about like the actual book and her adventures in this specific and like kind of maybe within the comic storyline, like where, where she falls into, you know, time-wise, I guess. Yeah, definitely. So Jeremy Whitley, who is a really great writer, great dude, um, wrote two volumes of the Unstoppable Wasp comics, and they're really, really fun. Again, it's just two trades. You can pick them up, uh, probably at Mysterious Galaxy. They're so awesome, and they follow the beginning of Nadia's adventure, which is basically she was raised in the Red Room, the same place that Black Widow was raised in Russia to be a super spy assassin. Uh, but Nadia, being Hank Pym's daughter, they assumed that she would have great skill in science, so they kind of put her into the scientist track instead of the assassin track uh so she ended up recreating her father's work getting those like ant-man wasp powers for herself and escaping and coming to new york city where she immigrated um unfortunately her father had passed away at that point but she did meet her stepmother janet van dyne also known as the original wasp who by the way is the woman who named the avengers she gave them their name oh, i, think a lot I didn't of know that know. fact until yeah. you dropped it in the book and she's a fashion designer and a, a science like lab leader as well, which is very cool. Um, and so Nadia meets Janet and then basically has to assimilate to this new life of being a hero, being a new American, um, making friends. At the beginning of the comics, she discovers that S.H.I.E.L.D. has put out their list of the 27, or sorry, S.H.I.E.L.D. has put out their list of the 100 smartest people in the world, and the mm -hmm. first woman on the list doesn't appear until number 27. And Nadia obviously thinks that's garbage, and so she realizes that S.H.I.E.L.D., the people at S.H.I.E.L.D. are just putting people on the list that are like their buddies, so she's like, well, I'm going to go out and find all the smartest teen girl scientists in the greater New York City area, and I'm going to make my own team team and so that's who the girls are on the sort of like interior cover of the book there this is what she calls her girl squad um and so that's kind of where we pick up the book takes place immediately after those two trades uh and so for this book I wanted to talk about Nadia having all these things going on in her life you know I was sort of drawing from my own experience with this and perhaps you feel this way as well. And I think maybe a lot of people do and especially teenagers, but I feel like I have to do everything really, really well all the time. And I have to be great at all things and do all things immediately. Like Nadia wants to be an amazing friend. She wants to be an amazing daughter. She wants to be an amazing driver. She wants to be an amazing scientist. She wants to get her mental health st like struggles in order. She wants to be good to people. She wants to be smart. Like she wants to be, she wants to do and be everything mm -hmm. the best. And like, it's impossible to do that. Obviously, we're humans, we're not robots. Uh, and so that's sort of what this book is dealing with. And it's something that I feel like I really struggle with myself. So yeah, relatable. I also relate to that. And I think um, part of what Nadia's story is, uh, it's interesting is she's got like an immigrant angle too, because she's from Russia. She's not American. So she's also learning to be like an American teenager. Um, and I think, and also she, you know, this is not her 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 mom is her stepmom and I think she just doesn't want to let people down so I really related to that for sure like I thought it was really sweet and endearing like to have her immediately be this very um because she has that desire she's like very vulnerable and um instantly I mean for lack of a better word really likable because she's trying so hard you know yeah um so yeah and she I really is like an eternal optimist like the thing about mm -hmm. Nadia that I wish I was more like because I, I feel like I'm very cynical <laughs> is like even though she was raised in this horrible environment instead of it making her like a very dark or bleak person or maybe more like Black Widow it's actually right. done the exact opposite to her it's made her like want to immediately see the best in everyone want to believe the best in everyone want to think that everything is going to be okay all the time um and I I don't know I think that's special like I wish I was more yeah. like that 
I know. I was like, girl, you were imprisoned for like your whole life. <laughs> I know. Trained by like really bad villain people and raised by them. And somehow you're this very sweet person, um, which is like a contrast to Silk. You know, Silk was also pretty traumatized. And then she has to go to therapy to like learn to trust people and be nice. <laughs> So. I do feel like Silk and Nadia would be really good friends and I would want to see something with them together because Nadia being raised in like the Red Room, which is basically like being raised in a pop culture free bunker, like is trying to catch up on all this pop culture. And one of Silk's big storylines is always that she was like in a literal bunker for her entire childhood. So she has like no pop culture knowledge either. So I feel like the two of them would be like, they should go like see movies together and stuff. They'd have a really good podcast where they like discover all like, you know, they're like, we're going to watch Friends. Oh, that's such <laughs> and then, like, a have an opinion on it and read Harry Potter and, you know, or something else that's better than Harry Potter. Um, you know, uh, so I think that, or they, uh, hilarious, they could watch all the Marvel movies. Um, oh my God, this is all, this is such a good idea. <laughs> such a good idea. We should have this crossover, like we should make this podcast for them. We should do that. We could be them. <laughs> it would yeah, be can great. You do a Russian accent. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I have, my Slavic is pretty okay. My mom is a Slavic immigrant, so oh, really? that's where I drew on, like, a lot of oh, Nadia's experience you, from. Yeah. About that, if, like, you were familiar with Russian culture at all. Uh, my mom's Slovak, so it's not, it's not the same, sure. um, at, like, it's not the same, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, she, English is not her first language, and um, I grew up really steeped in, in that culture, and their food and traditions and, and all of that stuff. So I don't know, I, part of this book is about Nadia discovering um, something that belongs to her biological mother and wanting to kind of try to connect to her biological mother through that. Her bio mom is Hungarian. Mm -hmm. And it was, that's where I kind of drew on because a lot of that is about her bio mom kind of thinking about like, what are the things I wanna do with my daughter who will be half American yeah. um, where I, those competing desires of in an immigrant family, there are these competing desires of like wanting to assimilate and coming yeah. to America and wanting that new life and wanting to be, you know, this new thing, but then also wanting to like preserve your culture and your traditions and all of these things that make you who you are and what makes you special and unique and interesting. And so there is sort of that like push and pull going on with Nadia and with her biological family, I think a little bit, which was interesting for me to explore because it's something that I feel sometimes too even as second generation where like I think when I was growing up I rejected a lot of yeah. like the, the Slovak side of my family because I was like no I want to be like Canadian because I grew up in Canada mm. but now that I'm 30 I'm like oh man I wish I had learned to cook all those things because yeah. now I don't and my grandparents are, are like not able to anymore and I feel like I've lost that connection and I don't know yeah I'm white of course so this is all there's like a no, but it's, it's, to it's, this that is it's missing kind of legitimate, you know, that's yeah. your experience. And um, for sure, I feel that too. And um, I think that's something a lot of readers would relate to, you know, it's that push and pull, that conflict, that um, discovery of this part of yourself that you're like, I feel like most people discover that when they're older, maybe from our generation. Yeah. But like the youth today, I feel very like, um, I'm like very impressed by how, you know, they're just way more in touch with that early, earlier on. And it's stuff that I, you know, in my books, I always like to talk about that too, because most of my characters are Korean American and their parents, um, some of them are from, let me think, I think in all of them, all, all the parents are from Korea. Um, so, Do you except, touch on that in the Silk comics that you're working on? Like, is that, I, you know, well, you can't talk I, about I, it a I, lot, but. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Silk, I did. One of my big things I wanted to do was to bring in her Koreanness in a way that felt very natural, kind of like seamlessly without it being a big part of her storyline, because mm -hmm. um, in a way, you know, her, her bunker life, her trauma is a little more like, it takes a little more precedent over like cultural stuff. And Silk is older. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you know, Nadia is a teenager and then Silk, I think is like in her twenties or late twenties. Yeah. So she's a little more, not as uh, maybe identity confused as much as like everything confused. Yes. Um, but I did want to like, I, I made a point in certain scenes to have. So I put in like illustration notes, like I want Silk to have this stuff in her room, like 
shrimp chips lying around or yeah. you know and I want her brother to be making ramen in a scene um I want them to make fun of the fact that their mom brought over like a giant crate of pears um <laughs> so you know those are the kind of things I was like oh this is and to me like when you're a Korean author um those are the things that you can kind of do effortlessly without making it big um to do about it but yeah I I, I did want to I did want her to feel distinctly Korean but the, I can probably safely say the story is not centered around that um, for this. I think that's okay though, because yeah. one of the things that we talked a lot about with Wasp too is not like, this is not the same as like a cultural identity, but for example, with Nadia, like she has bipolar disorder. Her father had bipolar disorder. So does she, um, but not making the book about her having bipolar disorder. Like it's just Nadia is many things. And one of them is a person who has bipolar disorder. She's also an optimist. She's also someone who can't drive. She is also a scientist. Like she's all these different things. Yeah. And this is one of those things. And I think you're right to say that teens today are especially good at like having all of those different pieces of their identity and being able to like pull from them in a way where like our generation like millennials I think it was a little yeah. more like it was harder for us like yeah. even queer teens like I always try to put queer people into my books and like even that like I'm bisexual and I didn't know what that meant until I was like 26 and teens today are like I have it all figured out and it's like amazing like I think it's amazing yeah for sure I always feel so old <laughs> I know um, yeah you guys are I, I'm like what are you even saying sometimes I think it's because we grew up without the internet and like teens now like when I think about the way that I dressed when I was 13 in like cat street yeah. boys t-shirts and like oversized stirrup pants yeah. and like didn't know how to put on makeup and I see 13 year olds now who are like better at makeup than I am now at 31 yeah. and I'm always just like I know oh, I just man. like to live more put together they like know how to present themselves I know they how to set up their zoom room so that they don't look like they're in a depressing office <laughs> we all went through that like very tragic phase that I feel like <laughs> teens today do not have to go through like the same tragic phase that we went through <laughs> um, I was actually gonna bring up the bipolar um stuff because I yeah thought, that's such a really interesting and I know that that was kind of, that's kind of like canon with her um yeah. but it, it's so I love that they took that tack with um with her because you don't see mental illness and you know honestly that was one of the things I love about Silk too that she has to go to therapy because she has clearly has PTSD from being in a as bunker. you would yeah alone for 10 years she self by the way a decision she made by herself to like enter a bunker for 10 years when she was a teenager until Peter Parker rescued her that is her story um and she got mad at him um but yeah the did you do a, a lot of research for the bipolar aspect yeah that was um that was really important the second arc of nadia's comics so the second trade deals with her basically discovering that she has bipolar disorder um having what is essentially a manic episode and um you know hurting her friends unfortunately and then learning the steps that she can take to manage that disorder. Um, and so it was something that we definitely wanted to continue as a thread in the book, again, while not making it the focus of the book, but just being like one of the things that Nadia deals with in her life and having her go to therapy, take medication. It was really important for me to put that in there um, because I think a lot of people deal with mental health issues. Like I have anxiety and depression. I go to a therapist. Most of my friends take medication, like almost every, like a ton of teens have anxiety and depression or other mental illnesses or mental health disorders or whatever. Um, so it's, I think it's really important to like destigmatize that and normalize it and talk about it in a way that doesn't feel like, um, it's, it's bad in any particular way. It's just a thing. And so we actually had, um, three different scientists consult on the book to make sure that the things that I was writing <laughs> were correct. So the same clinical psychologist who consulted on the comics, um, she also consulted on the book and was able to give me a ton of great tips and feedback. So there are certain like exercises and strategies that Nadia practices in the book mm -hmm. to deal with her bipolar disorder that are like real clinical practices that therapists use in real life for their patients. So it was cool. Like you can kind of learn something yeah. uh, if you're freaking out or having a, even if you're having like a panic attack or whatever, you can use some of the techniques in the book, which is cool. And um, yeah, I wanted to make sure it was represented in a way that was authentic, obviously. So, yeah, 
Yeah. It's one of those things that you want to get right. Um, as yeah. And I think um, you're, I think you're going to hear a lot from readers, you know, that are dealing with something similar. That's what happened to me too. Like, so I also have anxiety disorder and um, I, nice. it. I know. Yes. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, but I, I mentioned it for the first time in a kind of like a side character, not a main character in one of my books, um, the way it made me feel. And I was so, you know, I just wanted, I did that because I wanted to normalize it and I okay. didn't want to do it to add drama or to give this character a flaw or like something just to get over. But it was just like, oh, I want her to have this so that it's just normal. Uh -huh. um, like somebody having diabetes or, you know, um, and then, uh, you know, like Stacey McGill of the Baby Sears Club. Because think about, like, we didn't know about diabetes. And then it was like, we all knew about diabetes because of Stacey That's McGill. That's true. That's so true. You know? And um, then my, then somewhere only we know, I actually gave the K-pop star, I gave her anxiety. And she's actually taking, taking medication for it um, because there's a lot of stigma in Korea still with mental health and in interesting k-pop stars they have to have this perfect image so it's just something that i kind of wanted to explore too um i do think it's super important um but you touched on having scientists um you know uh, like consult your book and i was very impressed by all the science in this <laughs> thank you it made, it made me wonder like does sam like science does she know science I know a little bit of science. Thank you. There's something we pulled over from the comics is if you read the comics, there are little bubbles every so often that pop up that are like, Nani, it's neat science facts. And then she'll like explain the science that's going on in the comic in a very real and like actual way. And so I was like, that's something that I wanted to do. And it's actually part of the reason I think that I got the book in the first place because when Marvel was sort of asking me what characters they thought would be a good fit for me so before I wrote fiction books I wrote non-fiction books the two non-fiction books I wrote before this one of them is called Wonder Women and one of them is called Girl Squads and they're actually non-fiction books largely about women in the history of science engineering technology and math so for those books writing like short biological or short biographical profiles of women scientists I had two basically learn how to be a science communicator. I have a master's degree in English. I don't know anything about science. Like my dad's a computer scientist. I think he wishes I was better at it, but like I'm not. Um, so for those, for those books, I had to kind of learn how to read and understand what these women had done in their lives, in, ingest it, and then find a way to put it back on the page in a way that was, um, digestible for readers from like nine and up you know what I mean so I had a lot of practice making science sound simpler and more understandable <laughs> than it actually is I think so that was something why I was like I think I really want to write the Nadia books because um, I want to explain science to people and so it was really fun to be able to like in real actual real world science be able to explain like how would someone shrinking work? What would happen right. if you shrunk? Could you run on water if you shrunk? Like, what does the world look like if you were small? Why is it that when she punches, she's more powerful? Like, mm -hmm. how do bugs in a computer work? What is a bug? Like, all of this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I like nerd out over that stuff, even though I'm kind of terrible at it. I think it's really interesting. So <laughs> yeah, I'm glad but, you found it cool. <laughs> I am the same. I'm so not science minded in fact like it's really hard for me to wrap my head around a lot of scientific explanations of anything because yeah. once you start speaking that science language I'm like you know because obviously I can write essays about any film book duh, philosophy I've it's my whole life is liberal arts but then like my critical thinking brain just like something happens to it when there's science words thrown in yeah I don't know yeah. what it is it's been my whole life it's just one of those things and so I was like oh gosh there's gonna be science talk in this <laughs> 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 it super like for me it was really easy to understand and also I was like kind of impressed because it went above and beyond because superhero stuff you just kind of explain it away like even yeah. though you know even um uh Ant-Man like 
yes, it's all science, but they don't explain it ever, like in the movies. Yeah. Um, and not really in the comics, too. So I, f- I thought it was pretty cool because these girls are supposed to be scientists. Um, they're supposed to be the best and really, bra- you know, brainy. So you actually explaining the science. And I really loved all the fun facts. <laughs> Thank I was like, you. Okay, I understand this now. <laughs> I do remember writing it a, cu- a couple of times, and, like turning to my husband and being like, I'm not a physicist. Like, why am I doing this? I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'd be like on Google at like three in the morning being like, I don't get it, <laughs> but I got there. <laughs> but, you know, our, our jobs as storytellers, especially when we write fiction is that is his own skill to take something complex and something a lot of, maybe we don't even understand and like manage to make it, um, digestible and interesting and fun so it is it's like it is a skill that us writers have even if we're not scientists it is like that's one of the things that I love most about somewhere only we know which is so good but I I'm not into k-pop I don't really know anything about it except for I have seen many fan cams and many dance videos because I used to be a dancer and I love their dancing but having a look into that you give such a great like peek into that world and what that world is like and it was so fascinating to me oh, thanks yeah I, I mean I knew um more about k-pop than maybe like an average American person my age when I started writing the book but um because I'm Korean and I grew up with it but I was never like a fan and mm-hmm. I certainly this current version of k-pop is really new to me because you know when I started writing I was like in my 30s and I'm like I don't I'm like what what are the yeah. kids I kind of I'm like I know BTS I know like a few of these things what's happening and so when I I had to go really deep into k-pop world which is basically YouTube you know taught me everything and then I went on to Twitter like k-pop Twitter like who are your favorite girl bands blah blah and so I just made like a massive Spotify playlist um and then once I did research and I actually met like a journalist who covers k-pop you know and I asked her a bunch of questions and it was like holy crap this that's is so cool world. yeah and I you know it wasn't like a deep dive into the industry because like for example your book is not about science it's about the story of the character yeah but yeah. like you want to get those details you want to make it feel like it's a real world that you understand that the not only that the characters actually inhabit but like you actually understood as a writer so um yeah it's it's interesting and then you f- kind of feel like an expert after but then some people ask me like are you a k-pop expert now I'm like no <laughs> <laughs> do you have like, a bias did I say that right oh yes I well I have a bias from um in BTS um, okay V he's Hi. my bias and in fact oh my gosh I have <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> Which a reader sent me as a gift. It was so sweet. That's amazing. I mean, it's so funny. Um, and then, like, I love my favorite K-pop star is um, this uh, woman named Sunmi. And she's, like, a solo cool. artist. And uh, she was, like, a big inspiration. So, anyways, K-pop is this whole other thing. Oh, it's awesome. We have a ton of re- um, viewer questions. Should we do oh, some yeah, of those? To them. I think it's a good time um okay cool so uh, let's see let me open the chat here so Kristen is asking what inspired us to write as a profession do you want to tackle that one first oh sure um I it's one of those like I never I wasn't one of those people that like wanted to be an author since I was a kid and it was a dream and Mm. Um, I in a weird way I fell into it um, which nobody wants to hear <laughs> but it's because I you know I've always loved reading and I've always loved writing um, but I never connected my love of reading fiction to writing fiction f- because mm. it just didn't ever occur to me to like be an actual job um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that there were no Korean American authors that I read growing up no Korean characters in books so that was a an issue um but also I was a kid of immigrants um I had to follow like a more practical path so I studied journalism but I realized I didn't like sticking to facts and doing research (laughs) (laughs) I was like oh this is hard like having to write you know things that are accurate oh lord um and so I kind of went back to 
books, like just loved reading books and writing blog posts and finding my writing voice. And basically I went to grad school and I decided to apply to um, a master's program in publishing or an MFA program in creative writing for children's literature. And hmm. I came to both and I thought one is way more practical than the other. So I've got my master's. But while I was doing that, I kept going back to my writing sample that I made for the other program. And that writing sample actually became my first book. So long story short, my friend loved that sample and introduced me to my agent. And so it was kind of like um, all these things conspired to make this dream come true. And I always say like, oh, I, I didn't actually want to be an author for a long time, but I think it was always in there I just never acknowledged it because it felt like such a big scary dream um and it's something that now I look back on and I'm like I think I I always I did have that in me but I it was just something that I never wanted to say out loud that totally makes sense no I think that's amazing um I the only thing I've ever been any good at is writing I started writing stories on like a laptop when I was 12 I think and uh, I just have always, I've always loved, like Maureen, like I've always loved reading. I've always loved, I was a huge television fan growing up, still a huge TV fan. Like I just love storytelling in basically any medium. And I was a huge fan, uh, like a big nerd growing up always, like really into video games and sci-fi and all that stuff and did a master's in English language and literature. And then I got into sort of writing online. I, I wrote for, um, some a website online that was dedicated to like women in geek culture and was posting a lot about it online and I got a message kind of out of the blue from a woman who would end up being my agent being like hey do you want to write a book and I was like <laughs> Uh oh, sure. <laughs> like, I don't, whatever. Uh, and I was like, well, the only thing I know how to write about is like women in geek culture. And that's how my first book, The Fangirl's Guide to the Galaxy, came to be, which is like a handbook for getting girls into comics and video games and stuff like that. But for a really long time, I stuck to nonfiction. I have three nonfiction books, five actually, um, if you count sort of like licensed ones, because for a really long time, I thought that fiction writing was not meant for me a lot of writers talk about fiction writing in a way that feels very um I think exclusionary like they talk about like talking to their characters or their characters speak to them or like they just do what the characters tell them or (laughs) I connect with the muse and like I just I have to write every day like I think it would be amazing to be like that I'm not like that that's never once in my life happened to me like I don't have any sort of mystical connection to writing at all uh so I thought like I was not permitted or allowed to be in like this group and it wasn't first I got into video games and then I started making comics and then I finally started writing novels and it wasn't until I had gone through all these various steps that I realized like oh no writing is just something you practice and you get better at um and you read a lot and you write Mm -hmm. a lot and you practice making plots and you work with an editor or with beta readers or whatever and it's just it's like anything it's like a muscle you flex it and then you get better at it and yep. um yeah one of my favorite things is just writing in all different kinds of mediums so now i've written for video games nonfiction, fiction books comics graphic novels and manga like i've, I've done like a whole bunch of stuff and i that's like how i like to challenge myself so that's awesome. yeah um we have another one uh but, 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 did the cultural stigmas of these characters country of origin affect how they faced their mental health that's Hmm. such a great question does silk's (laughs) koreanness affect how she deals with her ptsd in my particular approach she is not that she's over her ptsd but the ptsd is not the focus as it was in the com the previous runs of the comic yeah um because if you read them she kind of um she really progresses a lot in her therapy. So I kind of wanted her to be in a better headspace. And it's more like she's got specific issues that probably still stem from the being alone in the bunker. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Issues with trust and being vulnerable. Um, And I, I did think of, I thought of Silk's crayon background, but you know, she, her parents are pretty loving and open. considering that they were all separated for so long and it's just been like a traumatic experience for all of them. So I, I did think about it um, because I, I'm always thinking about my characters, if they're Korean, like I, 
that's just like a part of the fabric. So I, of their character. So I, I do think about it, but in Silk's case, she was, I don't think that stigma was there for her as much um, because her parents were so supportive and that's her connection to uh, Korea. Mm -hmm. And then whereas in Summer Only We Know, the K-pop star, she is Korean American actually, but she's lived in Korea for seven years no, not seven, maybe five years being a K-pop star. And it's mm. very stigmatized there. Not only that, but like K-pop stars can't show any kind of weakness. They've got to be so perfect. So mm. she's definitely got to hide it. That was a big factor. Um, mm. She has to hide her anxiety issues. She has to hide that she takes medication. It's really, um, they've come a ways in Korea, but it's still like, in my opinion, they have a long way to go as far as, um, more acceptance and more um, openness in talking about it. How about you? Oh, that totally makes sense. Yeah, with Nadia, it's interesting. So again, the second volume of the comics deals a lot more with Nadia's reckoning with having bipolar disorder and everything. We don't really get into that a lot in the book. Uh, but with the book, the challenge is more in Nadia. So Nadia is half Hungarian, half American, raised in Russia, now in America. Like she's sort of all over the place, right? But what the really interesting thing about Nadia's bipolar disorder is the fact that Hank Pym also had bipolar disorder and very famously was abusive to his wife, Janet Van Dyne, because he did not manage his bipolar disorder properly. So he was physically abusive to Janet. It happens in the comics. It's canonical. Um, and now Janet is raising Nadia, who now also has bipolar disorder. And so that that is really interesting where like we're trying to... See, like Nadia's trying to figure out her relationship between herself, her dead father, who she never met, her deceased bio mom, who she never knew, now her stepmom, all these people in her life and kind of figuring out like um, what it means to be a good friend while also trying to be healthy and good to yourself um, and a good family member and a good stepdaughter and all of these things. So it's, I think it's really good that Nadia has Janet in her life as she's dealing with this. So it's less like a cultural thing and more of a familial thing, which is kind of what you said as well. But right. um, yeah, it's definitely, I, I love that we're able to talk about this. I think it's really yeah. important. And I do think the family factor is important though, because that's where it trickles down. The, you yeah. know, so whatever, if you have parents that have, are affected by the cultural stigmas, then they'll trickle that down onto the kids. So. Yeah. In our cases, the parents are not the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it like joining the Marvel Universe? It's such a uh -huh. huge franchise now and such an influence on our culture. Totally. Yeah, were you stoked when you found out about Silk? Were you yeah. terrified? Um, both, because I was <laughs> like, oh my God, you know, the opportunity to write. So I worked on like this giant Marvel art book back when I used to work for um, this art book publisher called Tushin. And I spent a year of my life, the hardest job I ever had maybe, um, cause the book is intense. <laughs> you see yeah. it. I forget how many pages, it's a bazillion pages and it covers all of Marvel history from the beginning to when it, when it was published. And mm -hmm. so I had to do all this research, you know, I managed the project and I had I read all the comics so I fell in love with um I always loved Spider-Man and then particularly working on this project I was like oh I'm I love Spidey the most like I had such a soft spot and then I love the new um Tom Holland Spider Spider-Man and Miles Morales like all the new stuff coming out of Spider-Man is like so dear to me so when I got approached about Silk I was like <laughs> what the korean american spider girl um you know i knew about her but i didn't know that much i didn't read the comics and i'm gonna be perfectly honest i didn't read her comics at the time and so i got this whole you know lesson in her comics and it was really exciting and then like my editor will tell you like literally at the last issue that i'm working on i was like oh my god is her character arc true to the comics what do fans like about silk oh my God, comic people are gonna hate me. You know, I just suddenly had this like, cause I'm not a comics person. Um, so I just suddenly felt like this imposter and like, our, and I realized that still the reaction to the announcement too. So the announcement came when I was working like on the last issue mm -hmm. and um, the reaction was so enthusiastic, which was great. But I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize I'm stepping into this huge fandom. Um, and it made me nervous, but 
as an author and I've written YA novels now, four YA novels, I'm like, you kind of have to turn that part of your brain off because you're not going to please everyone. Um, you apply displease a lot of people and you just kind of have to like stay true to your mm -hmm. vision and um, what and why someone would hire you and trust you with this character. So mm -hmm. yes, it was terrifying, really cool. Um, I'm going to be nervous when it comes out, I'm sure, but I think it'll be, you know, I feel very honored. I was like really, really, really flattered that I was asked to, to write her story. I'm like a huge Silk fan. I loved Robbie Thompson's run on the comics. I'm so excited to see. Great job. Oh my God. He's the best. Like so good. Yeah. I, I think you are more than a worthy successor. So I'm super stoked. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so I had worked on a Marvel sort of nonfiction encyclopedia of all of Marvel's female characters was like one of my first Marvel gigs. Um, and then I worked at a video game studio and was working on a Spider-Man. I had done work on the Spider-Man video game, which mm -hmm. was really fun because I also yes. love Spidey. Yeah. Um, but I, I've been a Marvel fan for a really long time. My dad is a huge comics fan. He was a Silver Age guy, mm -hmm. um, was always really into that. But I was not into comics growing up. And I think a lot of it was because, especially I grew up in the 90s. I don't know how much y'all know about 90s comics. They are not really for young girls <laughs> or they yeah. didn't look like they were for me anyway at the time. So I had never really gotten into them. But when I got to college, I discovered The Runaways. It was really the first Marvel comic I had ever read. And it was like, oh my God, I suddenly saw like queer characters, teen characters, like characters who looked and talked and acted like me. It was by Brian K. Vaughn, who's like a genius, obviously. Uh, and Adrian Alfona, who is a Toronto artist. I'm also from Toronto, which was nice. So I was like, oh my gosh, comics maybe like are for me. And that sort of kicked off my love for comics. So Marvel had gotten me really, when I started getting into comics, it was through Marvel. Yeah. And I read a ton more and became like a huge fan. Uh, so I got approached about joining like the Marvel, besides doing the video game, I got, um, I had done a couple short comics for IDW on like Star Trek and a couple other like properties and I got an email from one of my editors being like hey we're starting they do young readers or all ages comics of Spider-Man and Avengers and they were starting an all ages Captain Marvel comic Captain Marvel is my favorite superhero like from way back when she was Ms. Marvel I always played her in like the Marvel video games <laughs> like <laughs> Ultimate Alliance and stuff so I was like holy shit she's my favorite superhero and I like melted down I basically did what you did where I was like I don't think I can do this. Who am I to write this? Um, I'm not good enough. People will judge me like I'm scared. And I held off writing a pitch until like the day it was due, at which point I was just like, ah, and I like barfed something onto the paper and like a stress fit in like 20 minutes and like sent it off and I ended up getting the job. <laughs> um, and from that point on, I just had to be like, okay, like Marvel read this. I obviously see something in my idea that is like right. worth while and um yeah that that helped me with it but it is very like as a huge daunting. <laughs> it's daunting yeah you want to do good you know yes um what was your one of your favorite things you found out about your character when doing research hmm. that's such a great question i think for nadia uh i loved mm, I loved the idea, and this is kind of like Silk, but I love the idea that she doesn't understand anything about po about pop culture, because mm -hmm. I'm like obsessed with pop culture, so that's like basically the opposite of me in every way, so it was really funny to like try to think about someone who doesn't understand any references, like what, how does she relate to the world, because I basically only relate to the world through pop culture, like <laughs> that right. was interesting for me to try to figure out. I know, Silk had the same issue, but so I tried not to focus too much on that about Silk, because again, um, I feel like I was trying to imply that some time had passed. So like she's changed a little bit, mm. um, but it was- every marathoned like at least one thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Try to, I try to think about that though when I would reread, you know, and I'd be like, okay, I want to make sure she doesn't have too many, she's not too pop culture savvy. Cause like you, like, it's just part of my life. I'm really, yeah. my dad used to be like, if you could only put 2% of your brain energy from the celebrity knowledge to school, <laughs> you go to Harvard. I'm like, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, it's just, 
I realize I pepper my dialogue with like everybody's pretty pop culture savvy. Um, but uh, for when I was researching Silk, what I, I, we have um, a villain who is from raised in Japan. And so we're entering some, God, how, what can I say? There's a Japanese demonic element. And so that was kind of fun to look up. Oh, like, cool. Um, Japanese demons. Um, yeah, Asian demons for me are always, I'm like, oh, they're so creepy. Uh, so it was like fun to to kind of delve into that, not too deeply, but it was something that I got to do. And, you know, when I write contemporary YA rom-coms essentially so it's so fun to like do any kind of like monstrous yeah and I was writing stuff and I was like I can't believe I'm writing this right now like yeah blood is coming out of his eyeballs you know um, <laughs> that's so. actually one of the things I struggled with the most in the prose book um were the action scenes because I oh. kept getting notes from Marvel being like you've got to make this feel more like a a Marvel movie and in a comic it's so easy to be like this bam pop blood explosion like blah. it's you know your artist like makes it so dynamic because we're both blessed to work with like wonderful talented illustrators yeah, who make our work them, better like, have them do something cool involving kicking and then yeah. and then I was I'll like oh I have to write like a 20 page action scene in slow motion like oh okay cool I thought about that as I read your book I'm like I guess that was challenging because right well, it was the hardest part I think yeah, yeah without it sounding dumb because you're like then I move my left arm in the air you know like you're like how much am I supposed to describe I know um, I mean your action scenes are really fun and zippy so I think thank you they yeah. took a lot of work I'll be honest like that it was not my first try at the <laughs> so yeah. yeah um upcoming projects so what we don't know when Silk is coming out but it is coming out sometime mm -hmm. do you have anything else you're working on that you can talk about unfortunately <laughs> All my projects are like secrets. Um, <gasps> I am work working on a, another YA novel that I um, I'm so excited about. Um, has a bit of a supernatural element. <gasps> cool. Is it supernatural is something that's a little more than my normal. Um, hopefully, I can talk about it soon. But I am having a baby in a month, so that's your next big upcoming project. Yeah, that's true. My next upcoming project is a human being forming in my body. <laughs> um, and then I am also, gosh, everything's secrets. So that's keep a an lot eye on your more. Twitter, basically. Yes. Um, I am also like you trying to do other types of, I'm trying to exercise other kinds of writing muscles. So I'm working on movie stuff, mm. TV stuff, but it's all uh secrets at the moment so excited. I, I'll, I can promise you guys another YA novel and the silk comic will come out at some point <laughs> nice yeah and I have um Unstoppable Wasp that came out yesterday so <laughs> please grab it um I had a lot of fun working on it as my first YA book I have a bunch of other books out this year um in October yeah, I have a second edition of the fangirl's guide to the galaxy is coming out i got to do like a revised and updated edition called the fangirl's guide to the universe so that was cool because in the last five years a lot of people in that book have been outed as like abusers or like transphobes or whatever so i got to take, take all that out which is cool <laughs> cool who knew uh, uh, but that was really fun and there's a companion to that coming out as well called the fangirl's journal which is like a you know, you can kind of fill in your fun fandom stuff in there. So those are coming out. I also helped adapt Rainbow Rolls fangirl novel into a manga. Super fun to uh, adapt a manga. I worked with a really talented Korean artist called Gabby Nam, uh, who's like a genius. Uh, and she's, she's working hard on illustrating that right now. And then in February, I have my first original graphic novel coming out illustrated by Kendra Yay. Wells um called Tell No Tales it's a it's a basically a comic book based on the real life adventures of two like actual female pirates who existed in the 1700s and it's like them and their all lady pirate crew going cool. on like magical adventures it's also super gay uh it was really really fun to work on and then I'm still writing the Captain Marvel comics for IDW uh so keep an eye on that and I'm working on a bunch of video games we're gonna talk about yet but um yeah super exciting stuff so <laughs> I know but like, like all of that stuff I finished awesome. already it's all done so I get to take a break now which is awesome like I'm very uh, excited <laughs> in a weird way this is a 
we're all forced to sit at home and maybe we'll get stuff done but I know whatever. we bought a house I'm like that's all moving boxes <laughs> oh you're like having a baby I'm moving we're like living life on <laughs> quarantine hard mode right now we just decided to really like go for it I guess <laughs> like, so what are you moving this week? I, Monday <laughs> oh, god. oh my god congrats thank you yeah it's exciting look we're like leveling up yay <laughs> That's crazy exciting, but also like, oh my gosh, babies and moving in new houses and exciting and amazing good things. But Constance, thank you so much for having us. I love Mysterious Galaxy. It's one of my all-time oh, favorite stores. I'm so sorry that like Comic-Con is not happening in person because I always try to go when I'm in town, but you guys are really wonderful. Um, thank so thank you. you. And I was going to say too, speaking of Comic-Con, we have Plug Conquest. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> I had, that's right I, on June 23rd I also had my debut middle grade novel come out it's called Conquest it follows oh two gosh. um like two preteen uh kids two twins at comic-con like going on a scavenger hunt um and it's Oof. it was super fun I love cons I love conventions so it was like my, my really smooth plug right there but oh we're gonna God, thank you July 24th too so if you guys yes oh. bags, which obviously so you have to then make sure you come back July 24th for that but otherwise, I'm just like the busiest person during this pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> last so year I was busy. so busy. Like, and of course, last year I was like, oh, I'm writing so much. I'm going to take this year off from traveling. I'm not going to do any cons. I'm not going to go anywhere because like 2020 is going to be my year. Like, I'm going to go everywhere. Wow. So many tours. Like, no, <laughs> totally biffed it. Like, <laughs> doesn't work that like, way. Well, we will go ahead and say good night <laughs> to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Maureen. You're the best. Bye somewhere only we know. <laughs>